Hi there, and welcome to, gosh, I don't even know what episode of the Sage Running Podcast, but I want to do this one on uh, the dropout, the DNF rate, dropout rate, non-finishers, the 2018 Boston Marathon. What we saw was crazy. Uh, 60% of the elite field, that includes elite men and elite women, elite status at the Boston Marathon dropped out. I was not part of that technically elite field. I did get an elite start. I was in the, the top 40 or so group on the front of the starting line. I dropped out. I was not part of that statistic, but even if you took sub-elites like me, guys that are kind of ranked 20 to 40th basically, uh, there was a lot of guys that dropped out around me in the pack that I was in as well. So I just want to talk about some of the considerations because a lot of us got a pretty hard time and I do want to say the first thing uh, is I really greatly respect the people that persevered through the weather, through tough conditions, through pain and adversity, and f made the finish line at the Boston Marathon. It's always an accomplishment to finish any distance race, uh, but especially when you're dealt with that weather and you're waiting out on the cold starting line for so long. And you know, it was pouring down rain, 30 miles an hour wind, uh, it's about 50 kilometer headwind the whole way. Boston's a point to point course, so you're basically running straight into this headwind the whole way. And uh, sheets of rain coming down at times, standing puddles, water. There was, uh, and the temperatures just around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or I think that's about four or five degrees Celsius. Uh, but it felt, with the wind chill and being wet, it felt definitely felt like it was around freezing. And uh, I succumbed personally to hypothermia, but I'll talk, and I think that that's what happened to a lot of the, the elites, especially the elite men. The elite men was the highest dropout rate. Elite women, I think, was maybe around 50, 55%. But the thing about those statistics is 95% of the total field finished the Boston Marathon. So 95% of, of the starters did finish, 60% of the elites dropped out. Crazy statistics that, you know, usually I would say elites, there's always a higher dropout rates of elites. And this is even in, in ultra marathon races and, and other races. I'm going to get into that because we all have different motivations for running. And I kind of wanted to come at it from the semi sub elite national class perspective of what some of these maybe top runners were going through and why they dropped out but i mean you know at the top level it's a tough sport everyone's mentally tough everyone's devoted i really respect the mid pack runners and the people that finished who trained their whole life for the boston marathon or they trained all year trained super hard uh and you know work full time jobs have a family we're freezing cold as well, still able to finish. I even know actually a lot of people that even ran sub three hours, uh, more Boston qualifiers that actually set their personal best time on this day in April. And I'm gonna go into some of the science and physics and trying to get at this objectively with the what I think, at least coming from my <laughs> somewhat scientific background. I like to look at the numbers and the science and the data and try to objectively think about this, but obviously I'm biased. I'm biased, I'm not trying to defend uh, why I dropped out personally. It, it's I, I was really suffering from hypothermia, I believe, to what it felt like. And I'll get into some of the, the physics and of the mechanics of, of what it's like in the front of a major marathon race like the Boston Marathon. So we have to consider those motivations and those factors and know that a lot of these elite runners, a lot of them do come from countries, East Africa, but there are guys from all over the world, Japan, Asia, uh, Europe, the US, a lot of top runners that, that dropped out or had pretty good days, but what you generally saw across the spectrum with the elite times is that they were very slow. They're much slower times, right? Yuki Kawauchi, who won the men's race, ran uh, a lot slower than his personal best of 208, right? Uh, Desi Linden, who I was teammates with out of college at Hanson's Brooks, she, a lot of people don't remember, she ran 2.22 at Boston when she got second place. That was the year they had the tailwind in uh, warmer conditions, dry conditions, uh, and she ran uh, a, a lot slower of a time, but it's more tactical. And so there's those when you look at, you know, people say, oh, why didn't you run a PR? Going into the race, personally for me, I was trying to time trial because I wanted to run an Olympic trials qualifying time, a sub 2.19. I basically knew that was gonna be physically impossible for me. I had speculated that maybe going into the race, I would have to be in 214 shape to try to run 219. Now that I know the weather and what it felt like, I'd say I probably would have had to have been in 212 or 211 shape, which is impossible for me. I'm not that good. I'm not gonna be that good or that fast. So 
basically only I think five guys ran under 219 in the whole race and these are world-class guys these are guys that make the Olympic teams a lot of them uh, some of them are, are former Boston Marathon champions uh, it's a very competitive field and what you saw in the women's race was some really interesting dynamics with women that started in wave one with the mass start who actually ended up running faster chip times and faster times overall than some of the women in the elite start that happened a half hour beforehand. And that created some problems with uh, the prize money and who got what. It's a totally different uh, ball game. It's a totally different race. Uh, but at the same time, I think the, the BAA paid up the prize money for those, those women that came from, from behind, so to speak, in, in Wave 1, who ran great, incredible races and placed in the money. You get top 15 at Boston, you get money, but it's a big drop-off. If you win Boston, $150,000. If you get 15th place, it's $1,500. So it, it drops off very quickly, but uh, the point of contention was... A lot of elites are running for prize money, they're running for their livelihood. And a lot of these, these runners that come out of uh, East Africa grew up in, in some poverty. They grew up running barefoot in poverty. They worried about putting food on the table, they have to worry about clean drinking water, they have to worry about violence when they're out training, and they're trying to feed their families. So they, you know that kind of motivation to make money and, and do well in the sport uh, is, a, is a greater motivation than someone that like what I have, or, or even people that grow up uh, who aren't worried about those uh, more basic things, putting food on the table uh, literally and, and worrying about being malnourished from not getting enough quality food and nutrients and worrying about money. So these guys are running their hearts out and they're training super hard and they've persevered through a lot of really tough grueling workouts. You don't become a world-class elite marathon runner without suffering through a lot of pain and, and painful workouts. Now that being said, there's some physical things that would make it very hard when you have cold, wet conditions and you're not used to that sort of climate. So uh, the first thing I'm going to go into is, uh, well, the money and the factors of an appearance fee. So maybe a lot of people don't know this. I've never been at this level, but some of the very elite runners who are expected to be top five or top ten get what we call an appearance fee from a race. And basically, if they show up and they finish and, and try to finish well, they will get paid a set amount, whether it's 5,000, 10,000, could be you know $20,000. This could be a, a very large amount of money for finishing the race. But the caveat behind that is that you have to finish and finish pretty strong in, in goodwill, saying that you put forth your best competitive efforts. So a lot of these elite runners in the lead pack here, they're trying to run a really good race. Uh, they're trying to finish hard, but if they drop out, they know they're going to miss out on their appearance fee, but they still are suffering so badly uh, from hypothermia or not feeling the race that they will drop out. And I've seen I've seen elite top seated guys drop out in the first mile, the first two kilometers of Boston Marathon. They don't feel like it's their day. They might save it for next weekend for London or something like that. Usually, you're going to lose your appearance fee. So uh, to see these these top runners drop out in the Newton Hills or drop out at 16 miles or 18 miles or 20 miles and not even try to, to jog it in and finish means that they were probably hurting really, really bad uh, to give up that appearance fee and that kind of prize money. Now, we'll pull up some video clips uh, from the race because what we see here, the different dynamic, again, with the women's elite start, it's only about the top 40, 50 women that go off the line by themselves 30 minutes before the, the start of the elite men and the, the mass starts with waves one starting uh, at the same time. So. These elite women, they're, they're fighting the wind by themselves. They're in a pack that quickly gets spread out. Uh, maybe the lead pack, you could see uh, Desi actually, who, who wins the women's race, tucks in behind a lot of the other women. And in this clip, uh, you see the men's race also going on. Yuki was able to, to take it out hard the first mile, but even eventually later on, he drops back and, and starts drafting. His whole strategy supposedly was to try to make it so Galen Rupp would struggle. Uh, he wanted to make sure Galen wasn't sitting and kicking in the last 10K. He wanted to make it a, a fast, honest pace. And you see him coming through the first 5K around 15 minutes flat. Uh, it's a pretty honest pace from the start. And the women, they went out definitely a little bit slower but they were able to still tuck in these packs. And when you see these packs form, you see a lot of the top seated runners, uh, including some Americans like uh, Shalane Flanagan, Molly Huddle, leading this race. And uh, this is important because it's an important pack dynamic that you see at the very front of races. Whereas if you're with the pack and you're sheltered, you're getting blocked from the wind. You're not only getting less work to, to, to 
uh, fight through the wind resistance of running at that velocity, but with a 30 mile an hour 50k headwind, you're getting that even magnified even more. And if it can keep you warm, that's another huge advantage as well as the mental component of feeling like you're getting towed along by having someone, at least someone, in front of you. But because of the lead start, it's a very thin pack. And if you fall off that pack and you're in no man's land by yourself, which is where I've been a lot in the Boston Marathon, is not really in the lead pack, but kind of with the stragglers, there's no one else out there. You, you see the open road uh, at you and it might be 200 meters before there's another person. So you're feeling the full brunt force of the wind. You, you don't have to dodge around people, but at the same time, you're, you're uh, out there facing this, this headwind and when you tuck behind someone, you instantly start feeling warmer. You feel like you don't have to press as hard uh, because the wind resistance is a lot less. And the, the drag coefficient with the wind resistance is gonna be my main point actually of this whole talk. Uh, because when we look at the mechanics of the lead pack, and you see the men here moving very quickly uh, in the first half of the race, is that they're they're running really fast. When you're running 12 miles an hour, five minutes a mile, low five minute mile pace, uh, what is that, three, uh, a little over three minutes, 306 per kilometer, 307 per kilometer pace, uh, that's already generating a pretty strong headwind, right? You're already generating this 12 mile an hour headwind if you were in still conditions. Now you you multiply that, or you, you add the, the headwind just from the wind blowing with the adverse weather, and you're looking at what feels like a 42 mile an hour wind, uh, or a, a, would that be 65 kilometer uh, headwind, <laughs> 70 kilometer headwind. Uh, and if you're at the front of the field and you're feeling that and you're getting wet, uh, that's a huge force that's not only slowing you down, but it's making you have to work that much harder. Uh, and with the, the hypothermia, it comes with the moisture and being able to keep body heat warm, which we'll get into body fat percentages and things like that too in a bit. But you see these runners, they're trying to make a break, they're trying to make it out in front, and uh, what happens to number two here, Gladys Cheshire, or actually that was uh, Murga, she drops out. She doesn't finish, uh, and she's trying to make a break there by herself. In the men's race, you see guys like Karui here, former champion. Uh, he's wearing a Nike jacket, and this is the problem with, with elites wearing their gear and jackets, and I, I took my jacket off after three miles because of this issue. It wasn't because we were we wanted to... We did want to stay warm. It was freezing cold, but we wanted to run fast, and when you want to run fast, you can't have that much drag and you see his, his jacket's kind of acting like a parachute here. He's sponsored by Nike, he's probably got state-of-the-art apparel and equipment, really no excuses but for that day in his wardrobe maybe he decided not to wear that or he wasn't thinking about the wind resistance or his agent or coach wasn't uh, and it's flapping around in the wind and when you feel that kind of drag at this velocity running low five minutes a mile pace uh, it's a pretty significant thing you don't want to be bogged down by that and the other factor of wearing a big rain jacket is the and not only the wind resistance, but the ease of movement. You're trying to move your arms and legs and hips uh, very quickly, and if you're feeling restrictive with these extra layers on, it's kind of holding you back. Uh, so it's a fine balance between trying to stay warm, but not having this parachute-like jacket on or this wind resistance. And uh, you see the, the eventual winner of the men's race, Yuki Kawuchi, he's going without a jacket. He's got his arm sleeves on, but he's got his he's got a hat. He's tucking in behind these guys, though, with their, their parachute jackets. He's playing it smart. He could just be tougher. He could be better acclimated for cold weather. He did run a, a 218 marathon in negative one degree Fahrenheit a couple months before this. Uh, and he's, he's just a super tough runner, super tough guy, but... Uh, there's some certain differences in physiology between how well people dissipate body heat or keep in body heat to keep warm. Uh, and you know, a lot of these guys would probably be much, much better in warmer conditions. And I'll get into that body fat section next uh, with running, dissipating heat and being energy efficient uh, as we see these guys. But yeah, with the jacket, again, if I looked out the window and I, I saw the weather conditions that we had at Boston and I was just going out for an easy training run at six minute mile pace or seven minute mile pace, I probably would wear three layers. If I was going up into the mountains at, at a race like UTMB or doing some of the mountain runs I do up in, in freezing temperatures in the snow, I wear a lot of gear. But running, again, running low five minute mile pace on the road when you're talking about this wind resistance and you're trying to move your legs that fast, uh, it's a lot harder to say, oh yeah, I'm gonna wear a big rain jacket just to keep warm. That being said, you know, running six minutes a mile pace would place you pretty well in Boston this year. So what we see with the women's winner, Desi, uh, she did keep on a pretty nice looking jacket and she even had waterproof mittens, it appears, uh, because your hands get soaking wet. And you even see in this one clip, Galen Rupp, 
uh, top American seed didn't finish, drops his water bottle. He's not able to hold on to his water bottle, his fluid bottle, it appears. Uh, and so these factors all go into the mental game also of feeling like, hey, you know, I'm running a slow time, I'm not feeling well, I'm starting to get cold, my muscles are shutting down. Uh, that kind of might lead to the decision to drop out, but it also might force you to drop out because these people are really shutting down. Some people ended up in the hospital. Hypothermia, uh, people are getting body temperatures under 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And part of it also with the elite component is a lot of these runners uh, are very low in their body fat composition. A lot of the, of the elite men, they may be un under five, six percent body fat. So not a lot of insulation, not good for cold for cold weather running. It's great for hot weather running. These guys are very efficient when it's hot. If you look at the London Marathon results, even uh, uh, Kipchoge, who wasn't in Boston, but he's running London, he ran within two minutes of his personal best time at London, even in the heat, whereas people uh, in different different pace realms, even people over 240, three hours, uh, would run significantly slower off their marathon PR, whereas uh, he, he went out at a blistering pace, way too fast of a pace, still almost got within two minutes of his personal best time, very close to a world record, 204, in pretty warm, warmer than ideal conditions in London. So it would have been better for these a lot of these runners, I think, if the conditions were actually hot or warm at Boston. Yes, the heat slows you down, but these elite runners, their low body fat, are very good at dissipating heat. Uh, they're very good at not getting as dehydrated, and it's all about efficiency uh, with that. So lower body fat, more susceptible to getting things like hypothermia if some balance is thrown off. And with the moisture and the headwind and, and poor clothing choices, myself included, uh, it was... Uh, kind of a recipe for getting getting hypothermia, getting super cold, and just totally shutting down. Uh, so we'll look at that. The Drake coefficient, again, I already talked about. Uh, and yeah, the, the other mental attitude, I think, is with the elites, and I know this from being a, a semi-elite in a lot of these races, I've been top 20 at, at Chicago, I've been top 20 at Boston. Uh, I've seen guys at the Olympic trials who make the Olympic team spring off the line at 440 mile pace, as well as the starting line of the front line of the Boston Marathon, is that a lot of the attitude is not just about finishing for these elites. It's not an all or nothing, I'm gonna finish or I'm not. It's I wanna finish, I wanna place well. That's usually their main motivating goal. It could be a time bonus, it could be going for a time. I think in bad weather most people don't go for time, they're running for place. So the only metric that these elites have in their mind of doing well in the race is who they're beating, what place they come in, uh, how much money that is, and then maybe if it's good weather conditions, did they set a personal best time or did they set a national record or break a course record and get a time bonus uh, incentive or something like that. So finishing is not a high list on, on their priorities in terms of, of how they approach it mentally. Uh, whereas someone else who's, it's their first time at Boston or they've got a streak of qualifying for Boston, has trained super hard, has sacrificed super hard, has woken up at four in the morning when the kids are sleeping, has, has run after work, after dinner at night on a treadmill. They're amped up about Boston. They've been training super hard. They've peaked for it. They might be able to still run a personal best at the Boston Marathon and qualify again. Uh, and it's hard, it's hard for everyone. It's hard all around. It's just a tough sport. Uh, but I think a lot of the elites probably did get uh, criticized quite a bit for dropping out, and I'm sure that it's not something they take lightly. A lot of us, uh, not, I shouldn't say us, I'm not elite, I was sub-elite at Boston, but a lot of the elites, uh, you know, they're, they're very tough mentally, they're very determined, they want to do well, they want to finish, uh, and they could run until they, they set themselves back health-wise. Again, my philosophy of dropping out, and I, I don't take drop, DNFing in, in marathons lightly. This is only the second, the really the first time in 13, 14 marathons that I've done that I've I've dropped out. I, I dropped out of the Olympic trials in 2007 intentionally, knowing I, I was going to going in. But this this race at Boston, I really wanted to finish when I towed that starting line. Uh, and I don't take DNFs lightly. I've, I usually will try to finish no matter what, uh, even if it's like UTMB 100 miles and I'm, I'm suffering in the mountains all night for 26 hours. Uh, that was actually easier to finish than it would have been for me to finish at Boston. Uh, believe it or not, I had a nice warm jacket on at UTMB. It was 
not very cold at all. Boston, I was the coldest I've ever been in my whole life, and I was seriously thinking if I tried to keep walking it in or jogging it in through the Newton Hills, I was probably gonna collapse and end up in the hospital or something like that, and really set back my health with getting really sick or getting some sort of injury that was gonna just totally devastate uh, my season. So a lot of athletes, I think, think this way, and again, the, the top athletes, you know, they're, they're going for, they are going for money, but they're going for their livelihood. And it's, it's kind of just a different perception. perception. Uh, but I mainly wanted to talk about the drag coefficient, the wind velocity, and what it's like to wear a jacket trying to run low five minute mile pace. It just, I think it added a lot of confusion. And I honestly, in all my running, I've never been in that position running in those kinds of conditions. Even though I've run in, in blizzards, I've run in much colder weather, I've run in pouring down rain all the time. You never usually have a headwind that strong for that long. All right, so thanks so much for tuning into the Sage Running Podcast. Uh, Sandy and I want to make more of these for sure, heading into the future, some more ideas. Uh, thanks for watching along in the YouTube video here. I'll show, I'll show you some clips here of Yuki finishing. Yuki Kawuchi won the men's race. Total badass runner. He, he was tough. I mean, he didn't have on a jacket. Uh, he was smart enough to draft at times. He was also smart enough to surge at times to break open the pack, keep it an honest pace. He's just a super tough guy. He actually was working full time going into this. He just finally announced after winning Boston that he's going to go pro in running and be a professional. Uh, he was left off of the Olympic team, I believe, in Japan, even though he's run uh, 208. And uh, yeah, just the, the depth that the Japanese runners have and the toughness is, is really amazing. Really something to, to aspire to. But yeah, he works a regular work desk office job uh, and would show up and he won the Boston Marathon this year. Well, it was a great to see Desi uh, finally get the win after being a close second uh, running 222 before, which was uh, her fastest time at Boston with a tailwind year, but then seeing her come back and run another really smart race and uh, get the victory by quite a bit over some of these other world-class women who uh, definitely it, it changes the game when you have weather conditions like that and it's something that, that I learned going into this, but uh, again, I, it was a little tough to take all the flack uh, that some of us got, I think, uh, and I don't know if people understand the wind velocity of running at, at that speed as well as the drafting effect of actually having people around you or, or people in front of you and how it's a different dynamic and kind of a different race depending on on where you start uh, but again really thankful for the opportunity to be there really wish I could have finished uh, it's a very special event it's near and dear to my heart and congrats to everyone that was there that was able to to finish um, and and persevere and do their best uh, in these conditions. I think we do this sport because it, it really challenges our, us. And uh, you know, any service, any distance, it's it's hard if you push yourself 100% no matter what, uh, even if it's a 5K or it's 100 miles in the mountains and the, the adverse weather conditions or overcoming an injury or overcoming mental obstacles or overcoming a nutrition mistake could really throw kinks in your plan and how you respond to that and persevere to that is, is good character building and good for our future experiences as well as part of your goal setting process and overcoming other obstacles uh, and adversity maybe in your life that could you know help give you insight uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, it is just running. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in again. Really appreciate all your support. Uh, couldn't do this without the Patreon supporters. Uh, thanks to my title sponsor, Hoko11. Uh, really, really appreciate you guys tuning in and hope your running's going well. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, you could comment below with uh, future training talk topics or podcast topics or anything you'd like to see or hear about. Uh, be sure to subscribe, thumbs up if you like these types of videos. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate your support. Hope your running's going well, and stay tuned for more Sage Running videos, or podcasts, I should say.